Hello and you're very welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness. These are crazy times we're living in, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we hope you're doing well. We hope you're self-isolating and uh, looking after yourselves. Uh, thanks to the wonderful production team and Joe, we have managed to pull together a show today. We're going live from my kitchen in Limerick and Trimby's kitchen in Belfast. Pat is with the production team in Dublin all staying within good social distancing of each other. Um, we've got John Cooney joining us on Skype, and we've got loads to talk about. We're going to tell you what we've been up to over the last uh, week. Um, we've also decided that over the coming weeks, we're going to select a certain classic film, an album, maybe a game, and uh, discuss them in depth, because, you know, we love to talk shite about that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's jump into it and see where Trimby is in his house. Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Trimby. Well. This is, this is weird. About as weird as the rest of the world at the minute. Yeah, yeah. Welcome to my kitchen. Oh, it's great to be here. Welcome to my cupboard. You're covered. <laughs> Are we in the box room? I am. Yeah, I'm in the box room. I'm in the I'm in the room that I hope we don't have any more babies that we'll ever have to use. <laughs> if she stops tricking me, we'll never have to use this room. <laughs> Can be just for your wife's shoes. Yeah, I like uh, I like your headphones. You got a we got a, a proper DJ vibe. I feel yeah. like at any moment you're gonna go boom boom boom. Let me hear you say way <laughs> Yeah, I had a panic this morning when I only had a headphone that had this thing in it, mm. and uh, and I couldn't stick it in. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't <laughs> stick it in to the jack. So uh, I had to go with these ones. I do love that song though. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. I once I learned off all the lyrics to that song before. I'm not really gonna try and recreate them now, but yeah. Well, then you're lying. <laughs> it was it was a low a low point. Stop lying life. about nineties lyrics. <laughs> Um, so come here, you're in Belfast, you've caught up with the rest of the world, I see, finally, um, you're self-isolating, how's it going? It's, it's been, it's been, it's been long, and we're only getting started, <clears throat> we had, uh, Jack out of school, uh, I think officially they only went out of school on Friday, but we had him out of school Wednesday, Thursday, and he was miserable, he was so grumpy, so <laughs> we put him back in school on Friday, we thought we'll get a bit of closure, and he'll say goodbye to his mates, um and uh yeah that, that's been good for him so he's been good over the weekend but got a long long road ahead of us um how you getting on with the twins i'm good um it's been a weird week obviously i was supposed to be in australia at this very moment uh i know i was in doha and now we were supposed to be in qatar but yeah we were in dubai last weekend and everything was kind of play on over there it was like yeah we don't have the virus, all is good. Um, Australia at that time was even saying, no, we're all good. So it's mad how things have changed in a week. We we were supposed to fly to Australia on the Saturday and they we got news just before we were getting on the flight that they'd cancel the festivals. So we were going to stay in Dubai for a few days and do something on Paddy's Day. And then all of a sudden, Sunday morning in Dubai, it was like, yep. Yeah get out of Dubai immediately the whole place is kind of shutting down so we got home Monday night and uh yeah it's been a, a long week but um you know what it's uh it's been fine we're just as I think everyone is we've just been keeping our distance they've actually changed it from social distancing to uh what's it called now um I wrote this down which I thought was quite interesting Anti-social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, oh God, what was it? Yeah, this was in the WhatsApp group, I've forgotten. Physical which, distancing. Yeah. Which I think... Uh, makes more sense. It makes more sense. The social distancing, I think, was like uh, people took that as a bit of a, uh, you know, something to do. Just go and stand three meters away from each other <laughs> I was driving around and people were like purposely out on the roads just standing next to like three meters away from each other it's like <laughs> yeah. this it's a new thing it's a new thing the new hip thing to do so uh the who have come in and said now it's physical distancing which kind of sounds a little bit more hunger gamesy doesn't it <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. The WHO have said no social distancing, physical distancing. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, I think it's a good thing. Um, what's the what's the um, uh, what's the health service like down there? What's everybody saying? Is it um, is it is it all getting real? Is it all getting serious? Are there like uh, any, for we went to to Tesco's the other day and there was like a designated two hour block where NHS workers had to they were the only ones mm. allowed in the shop stuff like and then on the way home in the car um, Jack was like crying because where when are we gonna get our food? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to we're we're trying to communicate. That. Yeah, how do you tell kids? Yeah, it's 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 tricky because we don't want to frighten them, but we want them to know that it's it's not it's unusual. It's a weird behavior. The way we're getting on, the way our lives are at the minute is weird compared to the way they were two weeks ago. And we don't want them to just think that we've we've just changed or like this is gonna be the new norm. Like it is the new norm for the foreseeable future, but we want them to know that we are kind of acknowledging there's something going on. And he said, he said, uh, I hate coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> Is that wrong? The thoughts of a nation. I know summed up in a four year old, in a four year old tantrum. <laughs> yeah. I remember there's, there's a Simpsons episode where Homer is left alone with the kids. And he, uh, I think Bart, Bart gets a, has a nightmare that the boogeyman is coming to get him. And Homer freaks out that the boogeyman <laughs> is coming after them. And he like bursts into Lisa's room and he's like, Lisa, there might be a boogeyman or boogeymen in the house. I just want you to, <laughs> to be alarmed. And they're like, when Marge comes home, they're behind the couch with like a shotgun in the whole house. The couch is like turned upside down and he's just like shaking like this. So I suppose you've got to keep it under wraps for the kids a little bit. Boogie people. Boogie I think. people. Boogie people. You see how stuff like that was a big deal up until the last two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, that That's not a big deal anymore. Everyone's just, no. it's coronavirus is the only thing on our agenda. Um, yeah. I, uh, it's, it's just, I, I'm so, I'm like fascinated but frightened as well about the the effects that it's going to have on how, on how we inter- on, interact with each other and how families function and how, like literally, my kids will not see anybody else for 12 weeks. That It's just us. Mm. Like their, their horizons are going to get so narrow um and they're gonna hate each other <laughs> so, <laughs> um, or they love each other no uh potentially they might get more used to each other um yeah. but um we were we were again we were in the car the other day and um uh molly <laughs> molly molly like sings her way through life <laughs> like she has a few wee thoughts and she turns them into a wee song and she goes um uh i like mommy i like mommy I like mummy. Jack's sitting beside her, right? After a wee bit, he starts getting into it. He's like, it's, I like mummy. I like mummy. I like mummy. Looks around, Jack's smiling. And then she goes, I don't like Jack. <laughs> uh, and his, his, his reaction like, to it that? just dropped and it's just, his heart sunk. He was so on board with her. He's like, I like mummy too. Wait a minute. <laughs> that's the hardest part for me is adjusting to like being here all the time and i'm starting to realize how useless i am around the just the day-to-day nitty-gritty of family life usually i'd be ducking out i have, I have a meeting to go to and i just go sit in my car somewhere but, uh, <laughs> but now i can't do that I'm, i can't and it's just no escaping them in a small house like so yeah. <clears throat> just i know I, I, and, and i've put I, I there down how you maybe how much of a bad dad I've been with uh, with Katie the, the newborn not that new anymore like mm. nine months whatever same as yours but um, uh, I was w- watching her have her dinner the other night and Anna puts Anna like heats up the baked beans and just puts it on her on her plate like loose with no no, like, no cutlery I'm not expecting her to be like putting <laughs> <laughs> a bean yeah but just she just eats baked beans with her hands like with her fist she's like this She's like, <laughs> you know, and they don't they don't use their index finger and their thumb. They use their palm. Like the beans, the beans all make their okay. way towards the palm. The and then okay. I'm like, oh, that's so messy. It's so yeah. messy. But it's very very talented. She's obviously very talented. She's um, got a big future ahead of her in terms of uh, uh, eating beans from her palms. But um, I had no idea. I was like, Anna, is that what we is that what we do? Is that how we really, feed them? Like um, fed, Katie, because I'm always away. And the other two then kind of do nighttime routines and stuff, but 
Um, mm. Yeah, I kind of had the same realization. I think I'm a crap dad. <laughs> mm, yeah, my, my biggest, trickiest one is pulling the hand through the jacket. <laughs> yeah, and snagging what? a thumb. And then the thumb. Ah, da, 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 you can see them looking at me like, yeah. you don't know what you're doing. And then the thumb, get, you pull it out and it's just got four fingers. You're like, the thumb's back here somewhere. Like, ah! <laughs> That's terrifying. So yeah. I'm just like, this is a three man job. I'm like, Orla, help me get the, like, how do you do this on your own? Yeah. But uh, yeah, look, it's, um, it's real. But look, we'll, as you said, it's, it's going to last a long time. It's an emotional time. I'm, I'm getting a little bit emotional. Yeah. My parents were here yesterday staring in the back window of the looking at the kids for Mother's Day and stuff, and uh, that was both weird and funny at the same time. Because uh, if they was a normal week, they mightn't be. They mightn't come and see the kids for two or three weeks. They'd be grand, but now that they're not allowed, they're kind of showing up and stuff. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah. I I thoroughly enjoyed your show last week. I must say. Good. Good. Um, one. I as one of our penguins pointed out that it was more informative than a lot of like news stations or podcasts on the actual um on the virus i thought it was really good i loved uh mckinley and brad's on uh given their their thoughts from the the epicenter of the virus in italy yeah um, yeah and it's changed even since i think it was it was only just the weekend there then italy have taken a step further apparently really yeah because i, I kind of get the impression they were on I don't know if, like lo- what exactly um, constitutes lockdown, but I kind of got the impression it was pretty much that for them. But now, then, then I realized when we spoke to Brad, then he said he was still going, going to work. So n- all non-essential work is is gone altogether. So they've actually mm. gone even further. So again, we like from chatting to McKinley, it sounded like it was pretty um, uh, constrained in terms of activity, what they were allowing people to do. But it's gone even further, and it just shows how much further we can go <clears throat> we can go here yeah i think brad's was uh he was a little bit more concerned about what we were doing here and how we weren't up to speed yeah um uh, brad's used to coach me um at under irish under 21s he was our coach gave me my first big break um so i enjoyed listening to him well, I love his voice, like Andrew, when he says your name like that. Um, do you know, it's like, it's really serious. I remember my one of my first Irish, or Munster caps, was playing against Connacht, and he was coaching them. It was the following year after our Irish in the 21s. And I was playing full back, because they were, I was too skinny to be playing in the centre. I think I've told you that before, so they used to stick me in full back to keep me out of the front line. <laughs> and uh, I was out on the pitch before the game, practising, <coughs> like, kicking or whatever, and... Uh, Brad strolled over to me. Well, Barry, um, playing full back, are you? <laughs> Never played there before, I'd say, have you? Um, did you ever try and catch a win, a high ball in the, in the winds up here in the sports ground, have you? Um, we're gonna pe- we're gonna pepper you today, Barry. We're gonna kick every single ball we get. We're gonna kick it up in the air and see if you can manage it. I just thought I'd better tell you now, just like it, just so to you're prepared for it. You know, I was like, oh, I <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> Thanks, Brad. So Jeez, he tried to end your career early then as well, because he did yeah. end my career. That was the beginning of the end for me when they hammered us was over he? in Zebra. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He did. I, I, I think we hammered them that day, so I got away with it. I caught, I dropped the first one, and the second one came to me, and it was we were playing into the wind, which was lucky enough, and the ball was dropping quite in front of me, so I was running onto it, and I just volleyed it rather than trying to catch it. <laughs> and everyone was like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't know. Never played you're the one before. To pick, <laughs> you're the one to pick me here. Um, but, yeah, I loved I loved listening to Brad's. Um he uh he uh, i think he coached me at ireland a as well and wasn't there a story about he said war of nutrition instead of- i was there for that i forgot about that that's right a war of nutrition it's gonna be a war of nutrition out there today, lads. <laughs> that's You're right. like, food fight food fight <laughs> i forgot all about that i should have well it wouldn't have been the right tone they brought that up last week but oh, i forgot about that um yeah John Fogarty, love that story. Love that yeah. story. Oh, he's Brad's is great, man. I loved him as a player. I was obsessed with him as a player. He was that he that just di- he dived past every time he got, he got the ball. He was just yeah. dive past. 
um, but he was very, very good. My I assumption mean, like, was that back then, if, if you dive past, it's because you can't pass off your left. Is that... You could do the spinny one like that. Yeah, you just you dive yeah. and it just disguises it. Yeah, maybe. Didn't matter back then, did it? Yeah, no one could pass off their left back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'd um, be interesting to see, though, after, like, uh, so we'll, we'll chat to Kuni about this, about their routine and what they're doing. They're all going to stay fit, I'm sure. <clears throat> a lot of the guys have got, like, um, a bench, a few dumbbells, you know, I don't know if they'll be able to go for a run for a little bit or whatever. But anyway, so they'll be able to stay physically fit. But their skills are gonna struggle. I love it if the likes mm. of Kenny comes back and comes past on his left, <laughs> <laughs> starts dive passing. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting on my couch the other day and I was, I was thinking about that. Like, I wonder what the players are up to. And then uh, David Kilcoyne rang me and he was like, "Hey, bed, what are you up to?" And I was like, um, "Sitting on the couch watching the kids." He's like, "Go out your back garden. I've got a delivery for you." And I was stood out my back garden and I don't know if you saw the video. I did. I, I saw it. It was amazing. He draw himself and Ronan and Manny were they live in the housing estate behind me and they flew a drone into the garden with a can of beer stuck to the, the drone. It was it's moments like that that just keep you going in the whole thing. Yeah. Um I would have loved if it was a can of Guinness. Uh unfortunately it wasn't, but if they are doing it again, if they're listening, um, could you make it a, a six pack of Guinness next time? <laughs> Ronan was actually working on hanging it from a string. He's like improving his delivery techniques, I think. Oh yeah, and the then um, and then hovering it um, uh, above your head, and then just tilting it into your mouth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Aren't a glass? Into a glass with the head and all. Uh, so I also enjoyed last week. I must say about you calling McKinley's uh, wife Julie. That was that was good. <laughs> Me Julie. Uh, Me. <laughs> uh, how did that even happen? I don't know. I I just got the notes. I didn't even. I didn't even. Um, like second guess it or doubt it in the slightest they got the notes from Pat and then I was like Julie it is yeah. <laughs> he, he even let you slide for the first one he was, he like, was polite yeah, the first yeah. if he had been polite yeah. one more time if he'd been polite twice it's Julie from then on he couldn't then come back in the third time and say well you know what? you're regularly calling my wife Julie it's something yeah. else if it wasn't like he came back and said like oh, my wife's name is Julia it was like <laughs> yeah. my wife's name is Constant Stanza or something like that I was <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> um so apologies to, to to on your behalf to McKinley for that but yeah. looking from the funny I'm side. Gl- I'm still glad it happened. I apologize, but I'm glad it happened. Mm. <clears throat> the bunker idea, putting the Irish people, our our most uh precious and coveted people into a bunker. Uh-huh. Uh what a good idea. Um mm. who did you have like Drico? We only really got started. We we didn't we we should explore that further. Um mm. Uh, Trico, bon- do you put Bono in there? I put Bono in, yeah. Even though he's responsible for us getting uh, getting knocked out of the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. No, it was the Six Nations. Oh yeah, was it? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, oh, he was hammered. He was hammered by England. Getting hammered at Twickenham. Yeah. 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 So he got bucked out of the bunk out of the bunker. <laughs> I was thinking. Sorry, um, Bono. Arda- sorry, Bono. You're gone. Uh, you're out with the rest of us. Uh, I was thinking. Um, Ardal O'Hanlon, yeah, because we need something from Father Ted to remain after we're gone, but he has to go by the name Dougal now. He can't be called for Ardal O'Hanlon, which I'd say he hates that. I mean, he must get like people just coming up shouting Dougal quotes at him all the time. Tough yeah. luck. It's the only way you're getting into the bunker. <laughs> rules are rules. Yeah, and when Pat said some of the cores, that was great. Yeah. Like and and then I I said like immediately everyone assumes that it'll be one of the sisters who are gorgeous and talented, but no no uh uh-uh, uh for me it's Jim Cor get Jim Cor in the bunker. He have you ever heard his conspiracy theories? No, I remember you 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 mentioned this. He's um yeah he's got he's got a few thoughts. I'd love to hear what his conspiracy theories about this. That's why I want him in the bunker. Can we get because, him on the show? <clears throat> yes, he's uh he's mad he's. He's mad into conspiracy theories like 9-11, uh, climate change. Um, he believes the Illuminati are getting back together and they're getting back together. They're like, <laughs> they're like a band that broke up. Uh, the Illuminati are, are controlling everything in this new world order and they're, they're trying to um, just control us, basically. And that's yeah. why they keep putting these threats on us. So I'm sure this is 
this is in his eyes another man-made virus but yes yes made by the illuminati yeah that was good we'll get him on to find out what about um, so are you getting any um <clears throat> are you getting any exercise are you, are you training a little bit or um because obviously yeah. ginger got ginger just closed up here that yours probably closed a week ago did they <laughs> probably probably uh, six months ago was it you're so responsible <laughs> yeah, down there. yeah we're so ahead of you <laughs> yeah. uh we're delighted to close the gyms down here uh <laughs> It was, uh, I am, I'm doing this thing, uh, I'm doing 100 press-ups in, try and get 100 press-ups in a under month. four minutes. 100 press-ups in, f- <laughs> <laughs> in under four minutes. Try it. I don't think I could even get 100 press-ups. Go on, try it. <laughs> get, get, down, get down in the box room. What? Yeah. I don't want to. Uh, it's <laughs> it's tough, but it's very it's it keeps your exercise to under five minutes. And you're done for the day. Why have you got somewhere to be? <laughs> yeah, I just couldn't be arsed to be honest. But yeah, I had Anna. Uh, me and Anna, um, we thought right, let's do. It. And then we set up a wee circuit in the back garden there the other night, and um, uh, yeah, it was it was it was grand. But it could be just the one time we've done it, and then back to looking after the kids 24 7 let's say <laughs> but, mm. uh, but my my new year's resolutions um kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit first of all delete the facebook on my on my phone so i haven't been in the in the group so i'm just kind of find out what the penguins are saying through you and pat uh and rip by the spring Mm-mm-mm. just alive alive by the summer that's my new um that's what alive i'm doing just- <laughs> Just to look at that. Um, so uh, you deleted all social media from your phone? No, I've just gone through wee phases. I just took a bit of a notion. Now is probably the time when you need social media more than ever. To be fair, um, I don't know, man. I'm like Monday to Friday. I'm getting off it. I'm deleting off my phone. <clears throat> Weekends, I'm allowing myself to get on it and have a bit of crack. Yeah. But uh, see when you uh, get see when you get when you get the on on iPhone, you get the notification. You've spent on average whatever hours a day on your phone. Oh, if it's if it's I don't even, I'm actually embarrassed to say how many hours it is because I, I think mm. it's shameful. <laughs> but, it is. It's, but it's 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 it? horrendous when you get back. Yeah. Tw- Twenty one hours or something like that. It's just like <laughs> <laughs> I was asleep. What was? I doing? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm doing a little bit of exercise, trying to be mindful and meditate and um, uh, have a bit of crack, trying to. I'm like I'm useless as said around the house, but I'm good for morale. I'm good for a little dance every once in a while and an old Woo I don't know. I think maybe week one or two you might be good. Uh, Or it's like Daddy's dancing again. (laughs) (laughs) Doing my tits in Yeah, yeah. Well look, that's all she's got. That's all I got, man. That's all I got. Um but I'm look, I'm very proud of Irish people and how we've responded. Um and obviously the front line we all know like your wife is a doctor my mother-in-law is a doctor and we all know people who are who are in the hospitals working whether it's nurses doctors um admin staff or whatever like they're doing an unbelievable job so um yeah just we you know your heroes basically i think we need to get that across and Absolutely. all we can do in the meantime is just you know keep our distance physical distance um stay inside you know our penguins have been following suit i think a lot of people have been been on to us uh one of our penguins uh actually got onto us and said that he he's he has covid19 um which i thought was pretty cool of him to get in touch with us on facebook uh his name is johnster great calvertis or something he's a i doubt that's his name but um i think that's uh, mckinley's wife <laughs> <laughs> Um, Julie, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's her. Um, <laughs> Julie, so it is. We, I'd love to get, I'd love to get Johnster on the phone if possible at some point <clears> in the next few weeks and uh, let's see what, uh, how he's, how he's doing. So look, hope you're doing all right, man. Thanks for getting in touch and telling us that. Um, and yeah, so with the show today, we've got Cooney jumping on, um, to, to, to let us kind of know what it's like as a professional rugby player um at these times we've also decided that every week over the next month or two we're gonna take a movie or an album and that we love and we're gonna 
review them because we're such experts. Mm -hmm. um, so we've chosen True Romance this week as the film because it's just been released on Netflix and it's an absolute dinger. And then to, to kind of keep in line with that mood or that vibe, we've picked Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So we'll have a chat about that in part three. Um, but will we get John Cooney on the phone? Let's do that. All right. Welcome to the show, John Cooney. Thank you very much. It's, How, it's a bit different. Yeah, man. We're uh, live from my kitchen in Limerick and Trimby's box room in Belfast. Uh, where are you? I am in Belfast and I'm worried I'll be fixing my hair probably every two seconds when I can see myself on the camera. <laughs> so Looks great, man. <laughs> Looks great. Uh, so you're in Belfast. You're, uh, you're in isolation, obviously. Uh, how's it going? It's actually going all right. Yeah, I kind of like it. Um, it gives me an opportunity to read my books and stuff and I get a lot of slagging for that. But even play a bit of PlayStation. I've built a gym now in my garage as well. So I have enough things to keep me going there for a while. Built a gym, so did you take equipment from the from Ulster Rugby and bring it home? Yeah, it? I kind of robbed a bit already because I, I planned on doing it anyway, so it's kind of worked out pretty well. But uh, yeah, I ordered a spin bike as well to kind of keep a key, few kilos off me as well. Nice. So, what's your what have you been given a program by Ulster then to to work away on during the week, or is it something you're doing yourself? Yeah, well, the thing is, last week was meant to be my week off anyway because after Six Nations, I was meant to go to Poland, so. Obviously that didn't happen and just went up the coast for a couple of days, but I took that week off just to make sure I kind of mentally get away from rugby for a few days because it's more the kind of mental aspect rather than the physical, just give yourself a break. So I'm going to get back to today now and probably do a little bit. Yeah, they've given us uh, things to do if you want to do stuff, but it's kind of relaxed for a couple of weeks, I think, because it's probably going to be an uncertain season and could go on for ages. So I'll, I'll do a bit anyway for vanity reasons probably. <laughs> is there any touch points from Ulster is, is anybody I know last week you were saying there were um, small groups of guys getting together and doing kind of staggered gym sessions is that is that gone now or is there any kind of team stuff at all yeah no that's gone now just to, to show our support kind of to social isolation and stuff like that so no now it's more just self led everyone today could kind of go in and take some weights whether it's dumbbells or plates or whatever you need so now it's kind of off to yourself for a couple of weeks and kind of hopefully counteract this virus or try to prevent it as much as we can everybody's going to come back um stack so um <laughs> everybody's just going to be in their in their guys just lifting weights flat out um skill development will probably take a bit of a hit as well um uh, i noticed that ulster put up a, a video a skills video of the guy throwing the ball against the wall have you been <laughs> have you been doing that at all no <laughs> that's a i've been asked by a teacher i know to kind of do a few skills videos but i'm probably I'll probably get my football out and start doing my little shitty uh, skills videos and stuff like that. But no, I probably should do a bit to keep me ticking over, but I'll probably have my girlfriend out trying to catch the ball and I'll, pro <laughs> yeah. I'll probably end up pretty badly when I'm firing rockets at her face. <laughs> and and, and tell, tell us about the hair right now, Coons. We're all very concerned. Like it looks, it looks incredible at the minute. You look incredible for someone that hasn't been outside in a few days. Um, Thank you very your, much. Uh, your headphones, even everything, you just look amazing. <laughs> uh, tell us about the hair. Like that looks to me dangerously like a number two or number three when you're. I know. You're a zero or a one man. I mean, is this ominous looking down the line here? I know. Yeah, I don't know what to do now. I have a, a <laughs> last time I tried shaving a bit of my hair. You know, it ended badly in Claire er, in La Rochelle, and I nicked kind of the front of my hair. But <laughs> I, prob I probably won't do that again. That was. That was horrific. So I, I don't think I have the balls to to do it myself unless I shave it off. But I don't know. I don't see that I happening. I I started. I, sh I had a full beard the other day, and I hadn't shaved since probably November. So I I was just bored, and I started. I said I'd trim, so I trimmed it down to about a three. And next thing I was, it was gone. Uh, and then I just started like shaving my armpits <laughs> and my chest hair. And then I tried to trim my eyebrows, and I shaved them like a fucking two blade. <laughs> They look like they're. I look like they're like I've been plucking my eyebrows too much, but um, I shouldn't have done it. Do you know when you're too, oh. you've gone too far? You've done one, and you're like, ah. Oh. Yeah. So what happened with me, and La Rochelle? I got a new razor, and I stupidly was messing around with it, and I was like, oh, thinking it would be a bit longer, and I nipped the front of my hair. So I had a massive <laughs> hole in the front of my hair. So I then Snapchatted one of the lads, and he screenshot it and 
<laughs> everyone then found out but i was so conscious that i was then trying to put down on top of it <laughs> but i had to go out and get that hair filler like the black hair filler to fill the hole before the to game put it in. Wow. i nearly didn't want to play the game because of it yeah so mccluskey, like mccluskey had something hole. similar didn't he remember mccluskey <laughs> yeah. had something similar his was more serious though his wasn't a, a razor mistake no his wasn't <laughs> then the boys were slagging him that he got his missus his missus hair transplanted on to fill the gap <laughs> <laughs> Sure, he had that top knot. It looked horrific. Yeah, um, but here, so Coons, so right enough, like um, everybody just keeping themselves to themselves, just the same as the rest of us, and just tricky kind of routine. Has there been any testing um, with with you guys at all? Um, no, not that I've heard of. Uh, I don't think anyone's been too bad. In fairness, I'm sure everyone's obviously each day kind of down will send in the new uh, like rules around it or or ways to monitor yourself and. Kind of people have just been looking at that, and to be honest, I haven't heard of anyone at the moment. And obviously, if we do have any symptoms, it's to go forward, and we have our doctor in touch with us the whole time. So it's kind of staying ahead of that. And I, I've been quite good personally in terms of just trying to stay in and stuff, just to kind of keep away from in case, because you hear all the reports in Italy, and also reports of younger people struggling, which is pretty scary. Yeah, younger people, um, like, there's a big thing, isn't there? A big push to kind of get people taking this seriously. And um, obviously, um, it, it's starting to sink in, but it's something that's, that's took a few days to get guys to really take it seriously and, and see the effect that they're having, maybe not on themselves, but on other more vulnerable people. It's worrying. I even saw, uh, I think it's a South African swimmer talking about having it and how he was struggling and he's in his peak fitness mm. and stuff like that. So it's pretty scary to see the effect of of the virus on people who are, are meant to be outside of that uh, worried zone or worried grouping. So it's, it's, it is worrying. Hmm. Um, Kuhn, so you, you're, you're, as you said, you're a guy that's into his books and, uh, and you get slagged for that. And, and, uh, and your, I suppose your mental approach to the game, which I've found very interesting listening to you talk about it. Um, is there anything you're doing at the moment? Is there any kind of plan you have for the next couple of months to, to get stuck into that side of things? Um, yeah, well, like I said, I kind of enjoy my bit of time reading Ryan Holiday's other book, Stillness is the Key at the moment, which is probably a pretty pretty fitting book for this type of time. And um, Yeah, probably I someone had uh, put up a link of online courses that you can take for free, um, so it might be an opportunity to kind of look at introduction to psychology or something like that, seeing as I'm quite interested in that aspect of it. And yearly, I always say I'm going to learn about accountancy so that I can do my own accounts at the end of the year, and I haven't. So every year on my New Year's resolutions, I put that in. So, yeah, so yeah maybe I'll, even though I did commerce, so I should know it. I, okay, I yeah. compensated my three E's and got out of there. So, yeah, I should, okay. I should know accountancy, but I don't. So, yeah, no, like that each day. Probably today, I'll probably try and treat it like a normal week. So today's a Monday, so... I said I was going to write down my plan of, of action for the day, whether that's gym, whether it's a bit of time to myself and stuff. So I'm going to treat each week kind of like a normal week and, and try and stay on top of things because it's pretty pretty tough when you don't know what day it is and stuff like that. So I'll try and treat my, my during the week as just a normal week, I'd say. Yeah. And what about that stillness is the key. What, um, what, what is the, what's the idea behind that book? Yeah, it's, it's similar to, I just read, uh, Another book, sorry, it's on my Kindle, um, about the Dalai Lama, and it's probably actually even better in terms of, not. I'm not a spiritual type person at all, but just in, in terms of the way you react to things and kind of get a hold on, on that, your psychology or your mental health, so um, it's just pretty interesting about your mind, body, spirit and stuff like that, so I'm just only on the first bit, which is about the mind and just kind of how you perceive everything that happens to you, and in general, Ryan Holiday, he has The Obstacles the Way, which is a book I read uh, before my summer training with Ireland and before the World Cup and stuff and found it incredible. Some of the quotes on that is probably things that changed my outlook on, on getting through adversity and stuff like that. So I'd, I'd recommend them and I'll probably go and reread that book because he got in touch with me recently and he uh, sent me signed copies of the book. So it's pretty cool. Wow. wow. Yeah. How did that come about? I've, re- I've read like Obstacles Away and The Daily Stoke, his other one. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of, it's something I read every day. Um, and I feel he's a very practical way of looking at things like that, right? He can kind of make it um, something more relatable, as you said, like the Dalai Lama and the mindful stuff can get a little bit, I don't know, it can be a little bit harder to grasp in, in everyday life. But his his approach, for me anyway, was very digestible. But 
How did that come about? Did he see you talking about it? Or yeah, very, very like random. I'd, I'd mentioned in an article, I think, uh, the book, and I remember I was sitting home watching a uh, Champions Cup game, and I got a DM off Danny Cipriani being like, hey, you made uh, Ryan Holiday's looking for your number. I obviously told that was incredibly random. Firstly, I don't know Danny Cipriani, so I just replied <laughs> <laughs> replied with my number, being like, oh, that's great or whatever. And he just got in touch with me, being like, hey, man, I heard you like the book, etc. And yeah, it was like, I'd love to send you a signed copy and stuff. So it was pretty cool. Wow. That's brilliant. Um, so you're obviously, uh, Coons, you're obviously with a lot of the stuff you're kind of absorbing at the minute. You're obviously um, a thinker uh, and a scholar. Um, by, by contrast, I know Gilly's been reading The Wolf of Wall oh, Street Jesus. for five years. <laughs> 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 and last I heard, he was 150 pages into it. Do you, th- do you think this might be an opportunity for him to finish The Wolf of Wall Street? I talked him into getting the Kindle, and honestly, I roomed with him for two weeks in South Africa, and he didn't read one page, and he kept putting up his stories of it, and no page is read. I had to honestly give out to him the whole time. Yeah, he, no, he's an absolute simpleton. Sure, he's doing, uh, his, he's doing his nine-year uh, law course, so. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. That was on course, last I heard. Um, let's talk about, um, you know, it, it seems trivial talking about talking about rugby, but let's talk about this, this season, because... Um, the way things were going for you personally, for Ulster in general, but for you, kind of, um, I don't know how many times, I, I'm, I bet you know the data, I bet you know the stats, <laughs> how, many, how many of the man of the match performances you've had um, this Actually. season, but it was just relentless, it was either you or Marcel, uh, and then there was a big push for you to get started in the Six Nations, um, obviously the way the season's gone now, it's all irre- irrelevant, but um, uh, it was that disappointing whenever you kind of felt like you had a lot of momentum and th- you didn't quite get the start you would have wanted or were you kind of happy you got your foot in the door and got a bit of game time yeah it's it's that type of question it's quite tough to answer that sometimes but I tried going back to the way I've, I started viewing things and stuff like that I, I learned that I was in a much better position than I was a year before so I felt the year before I played what four of the five six nations games but I felt I was nearly getting picked just due to injuries so I felt firstly that I'd earned my spot, which which made me feel pretty good from from the hard work I put in, and secondly, when I when I saw that and, and viewed it, that getting annoyed or getting disappointed wasn't really gonna better me or, or make me play better off the bench or whatever it was. So I I was disappointed. I obviously want to start, but when I looked at it kind of from that point of view, I was pretty happy with where I'd gone in a year, and even the disappointment of the summer not making the World Cup squad, obviously that was a massive low for me. So. For me to bounce back, get to where I had planned to get to and made goals to get to. Um, in that way, when I was able to view it that way, I was pretty happy with where I got to. You must have been thinking then, um, if the Italy game had gone ahead, that would have been a good opportunity for you to get a start? Basically, yeah, I put that down, obviously. But as you said, it is disappointing. But a worldwide pandemic, what the hell, you're not going to expect something like that. So it's a pretty valid reason for, for a game not to go ahead. So feeling sorry for myself wasn't going to do much to be honest. Is, that what, is that what Farrell said to you listen I'd love to start you this weekend but there's a worldwide pandemic <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically yeah and then so what about then uh, moving out of Six Nations then um, obviously the no rugby for the foreseeable future European Cup it would have been nice for you um, although you got a great ex- a bit of experience in the Six Nations I'm sure it was good for you to kind of feel like you were there uh, on merit but there was probably, I don't want to put words in your mouth, there was probably a part of you wanted to get back to Ulster because everything you touched turned to gold all season just to get back in there and get back in the groove and get back in the moment, momentum again. Um, is that disappointing now then from that perspective with, with European rugby especially, with the Toulouse game, big challenge, big opportunity against DuPont head-to-head? Um, is, that, is that a big opportunity missed? Yeah, uh, like you said, it, it is a place that I love to get back to and in the summer, going back to that again, I, in a weird way, I was happy to get back to the province that I enjoy playing with and all my friends and stuff like that. And that, I think that's why I came back playing well or, or, or hit the ground running quite early was because I was in an atmosphere or environment that I really enjoy. So, you know, when you're in the international setup, sometimes it can be a lot of stress and stuff like that. But I told myself after that disappointment that I was just going to be myself and whatever works for me works for me. And if, if it doesn't, it doesn't. I, I just said, I'm going to be in, in I'm going to enjoy what I'm doing and that's basically when you get your best self and, and I kind of learned that years ago when I moved to Connacht on loan and stuff like that and, and end up staying there due to the fact that I really enjoyed the environment so that's what I told myself in the summer and obviously I, those six, seven weeks of, of Irish camp I didn't get to play as much as I had and I do think the more I play the better I play because I get that continuity so I was looking forward to getting back but 
yeah, that, that quarterfinal, I, we hope it does go ahead eventually if it can or, or we don't really know what's going to happen, but it doesn't look likely at the moment. But it, it would be great for us because the position we've been in all year, we've been going well. So it, I was very optimistic with us in, in Europe and in the Pro 14 and how we could do. Uh, the thought of playing it behind, behind closed doors, um, that's been talked about a little bit. That would be a pretty unique experience, wouldn't it? Going to, going to Toulouse and playing it in an empty stadium. Yeah, it would be different. It would be like out in Peary Park every week and the, the blustering wind and stuff. But yeah, like that, uh, as I said, we have a good team and we back ourselves to do well in that quarterfinal. So if that is what we have to do, I'd be happy to play it. It concerns me, you know, the, the, the thought of um, uh, Ulster in particular, um, the only province I'm really concerned about. <laughs> 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 it concerns me uh, going to Toulouse having played no rugby and it, we could get back to the stage where you've got a French side who are just unbelievably talented and you've got the Irish provinces who typically were greater than the sum of our parts we're, sure we're talented but we work hard and we we kind of think through a game plan whenever no one plays rugby for you know six, eight weeks whatever it ends up being it just comes down to pure talent now Ulster like we're talented okay but Toulouse, they look like a side, they look like the Toulouse from, from 15 years ago when we're all massive Toulouse fans. Do you know what I mean? It could just come down to talent. If it just comes down to talent, then there's no white smart in these guys. These guys are just seriously, seriously talented. Could be an even bigger challenge. Yeah, but it, they also mightn't, it's not just down talent, it'll be hard work as well. So they mightn't be doing the fitness required to play an 80 minute European quarterfinal game. So I think the work also did in the summer and, and individuals it's incredible we got a lot of hard work in individuals so I think here people are going to work very hard and come back as fit as they probably were before so I don't think a French team if you haven't done any running are going to be able to play a quarter final that in the way we play at the moment we move the ball a lot as well and, and speed of the ball away so there's always two ways to look at everything I can't even handle how hypothetical this question is. Like, <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. And if you and if you were to play to lose on the moon, what would you think that would be like? Um, uh, look at yeah, who knows the way it's gonna it's gonna go. But I love uh, the bit of business that Ulster have done over the last two weeks as well, man. Albie Matheson obviously was a huge um, a huge part of Monster Rugby over the last couple of years and a lot of experience. Great to see him coming back uh, this side of the world and. Obviously, Ian Madigan, I think that's an incredible signing for you for next year. Um, how do you feel about those two two additions? Yeah, I think it's great. I, I do think we need a strength and depth in, in every position, really, because if you want to win a championship, and, and speaking to Dan, we need that strength and depth in all these positions because we do want to win championships and, and want to be competing all the time. So definitely for me to learn, I've learned off Isaac Boss and Owen Redden in the past, and I'm obviously getting older now, but for Albie to come in, someone who's meant to be an unbelievable squad player is great and, and I always like to learn off different types of players. He's he's obviously a little bit different to me and, and then also to Shanders and stuff. So we've, we've got a great group of nines here with Johnny Stewart as well. So it'll be good to learn off him and then with Mads, I've, I've known Mads since I was 17, 18 and played together for years. So it'll be great to have him in and I think he's learned a lot in his travels and, and yeah, I think he'll bring that new bit of life that say Jack McGrath and stuff did last year. So it'll be good to have these new players come in Hmm. Um, to take us back to that. So you were in in Leinster with Ian Madigan back in the day, and you were you were uh, under Owen Redden, I suppose, and under Isaac Boss. Um, was that a? It must have been a very tough decision for you to to leave Leinster and go to Connacht at that time. But um, can you take us back and you remember what it was like uh, making that step? Yeah, no, I do. I remember it well. Um, it wasn't really a decision of mine initially. It was. Uh, Matt O'Connor uh, rang me up. I was actually in Mayo because my mum's from around there. She's on the border between Mayo and Sligo, but we have a house in Balna. Um, and he rings me asking would I like to go on loan to Connacht. So pretty fitting that I was currently in Mayo at the time. But um, I remember just feeling like he was he was trying to get rid of me because I think I'd been there about a year with him and he hadn't really picked me too much. And before that, I'd, I'd played a good bit under Joe. So it was quite disappointing. But I'd also gotten shoulder surgery because my shoulder's at me for the year, kind of. Um, and he just asked, yeah, what do I think of going on loan? And initially, like I said, I was annoyed thinking he was trying to get rid of me, but then I just saw it, cha again, change the way I think and just saw it as an opportunity maybe to get down there or get across and, and do a bit of training and get into the team. But the problem was that I had to do my rehab with Leinster until de September. So by the time I got to Connacht in September, I didn't know any of the plays and I didn't know anyone. So it took me till end of December to even get my first cap. So 
it was pretty typical mm. that even by the time I got down there I was struggling I had to play I was cup tied so I couldn't play Europe so I had to play all the Connacht Day games um, so yeah it was a pretty tough first year and um, yeah one that I learned a lot about myself especially in that really? wet windy weather yeah yeah absolutely a tough a tough place to, to go uh, and to play once or twice a year let alone try to play there weekly when you're not used to it yeah um, but I suppose then the move to Ulster um, the rest is history really it's uh, you've kind of taken to that really well obviously you're uh, you, you're playing so well and, and Dan is, has kind of the, the team um, so well oiled and well drilled uh, you're loving life in Belfast I am yeah um, it was obviously a bit daunting at the very start when I first came up and I didn't even have anywhere to live so I remember my first week I was uh, sleeping on the floor uh, one of my friend's brothers had a mattress so I was just sleeping on the floor for the first like two three weeks there um, tied in with a ridiculously tough uh, pre-season where we were running up and down the sand dunes I just remember going home and being being pretty pissed off all the time I nearly uh, and things with my girlfriend due to me being cranky all the time but um, yeah since then it's gone unbelievable um, like that I think the tough times at the very start kind of made me appreciate how big of a, a move it was and I'd already done it before so to be honest I'd never worried about it and I knew like I said if I enjoyed the environment time. on myself um, people take you for what you are you're going to enjoy yourself and that's kind of what I did I, I've always been someone who's worked hard so in Connacht I, I worked incredibly hard and probably too hard sometimes where I kind of injure myself off the back of it so I, I knew in that pre-season if I worked hard and, and started well for us the things were going well yeah. Trimby, Trimby what's your memory of, uh, of, of John coming to, to us for the first few months the, your, uh, you made an impression early on Coons <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily a positive one, but yeah. <laughs> we were. It must have. It, it, you must have been very conscious of um, of the fact that Pinar was leaving, yeah. and you're obviously filling uh, big shoes because Les Kiss asked you to introduce yourself. Do you remember this? Les yeah, Kiss asked I remember you to introduce this, yeah. yourself, <laughs> and uh, you went in like ballsy enough. This 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 posh kid from Dublin came in, and obviously like. Ruan was everything to us, and uh, him moving on was an emotional, uh, an emotional piece. And uh, Kuhn said, um, "I'd just like to apologise for the for the passing of Pinar, as in the passing, like he died, not his poor passing." <laughs> <laughs> it, it, no one got it though, because the passing. No, it. I, I I went. What did he? What did he say there? Because just because of the confusion, uh, layered. We all thought, oh, layered, layered, layered. Yeah. Well, accidentally yeah. layered. <laughs> I just so, sat back down though. I remember just being like, sat back down. <laughs> yeah, I know it was. It was. It, it went really flat. It didn't go down well at all. But a part of me went, if that's what he meant by that, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> he's gonna, I, he's gonna be. Should used a better tough, word. <laughs> yeah, that was a tough first encounter. But he's gonna be. If he keeps coming out with stuff like that, that's gonna be good yeah. stuff. So I'd say um, John O'Gibbs was like, ah, crap. He's just that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was a tough, tough first meeting for you. But um, I kind of, you kind of set your stall out pretty early, and uh, it didn't take you long before you became part of the furniture up there and became um, central to everything good that Ulster were doing on on the pitch and off the pitch. So um, was that was that Pinar thing? Was it? Were you mindful of that? Shush, dog. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, shit, I was pressing me. Uh, Claire, will you take the dog, please? <laughs> um, yeah, obviously I was mindful of it, but it probably, again, going back to that, it kind of gave me a reason with that chip on my shoulder, whatever it was, to, to come up. And I'd heard all the noise and stuff. Bye-bye, dog. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it was obviously tough times, but I, I, I don't know why, maybe ignorance or what, I kind of put it to the back of my head and didn't really let it affect me, because coming up I wasn't even, I'd only goal kicked a little bit, I wasn't really a goal kicker, so I didn't come up thinking I was going to do the kick and, and stuff like that, because I'd only done it in probably three or four games ever, so. Really? Yeah, like that, oh. it just came that when I did move up, the opportunity to kick came along and then obviously that puts more pressure on you and stuff. But I saw it as an opportunity rather than, yeah, that even from the first time I ever kicked, I, I just, everyone thinks I was going to miss anyway. So I was like, screw them all. I might as well try and get them. That was my mentality from the start. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, I remember hearing Raj talk about that recently where he he didn't start goal kicking till 
I think he might have been 19 or 20. He never he never goal kicked in school. I think they had a 12 throughout his school years that kicked. Um, you kind of assume that someone like yourself and Raj have been kicking goals since they were 9 or 10 years of age and uh, and you've built up that experience. But uh, that's such a refreshing way to look at it that, fuck it, I've yeah. nothing to lose. Um, so uh, did you feel like you just took naturally to it? Is it a, a technique that you just, you had it the way, you know, day one and that was it, you stuck by it? Or have you had to to learn or adjust the way you kick the ball as someone told you how to it was probably, change the way you kick it? It was probably quite raw, to be honest. Um, when I was younger, I used to get too pissed off if I missed. So in school, I never kicked. In um, university, I didn't kick. In Leinster, I never got to kick. So um, I always enjoyed it. So I used to do it sometimes as just because I found it fun just kicking the ball because I played a lot of soccer when I was younger. I used to enjoy kicking, but... I didn't really have a plan. Um, my first kicking tee was one of my friends' spare kicking tee, and I still use it. Um, stuff like that. So I was, it was just a day in Connacht, so there was two injuries with the out halves. Um, and I was like, feck it, I'll go out and kick or whatever. Um, Tiernan O'Halloran came out to kick, Kieran Marmy came out to kick. So it was basically whoever can kick will be the second choice kicker this weekend. And Marmo and Tiernan both went in with strains in their quads so basically it's just me <laughs> me left so I was like I'll kick but I was actually kicking quite well but again I just taught myself a technique and I used to kick with Richie Murphy sometimes I'd do the kicking competition at the end with him and Madigan and stuff uh, just for the fun of it um, so I'd always watch kickers and I'd always thought I could do it by watching them be like I can do kick as well as these because I found sometimes I'd have to kick because they had to kick or they weren't as natural whereas I thought I could strike a ball quite well um, so that day I was second choice kicker, go to Grenoble, uh, come on, first kick in professional rugby, just kind of slightly to the right of the post to win the game, get it, uh, they go down, hit a drop goal, they win. The next week, I, they go, oh, you might as well kick again. So I kicked against Treviso, uh, kick from the corner to go 21-19 up, get it, uh, they get a kick from the halfway line to win the game. So I was like, for feck's sake, here's two <laughs> kicks I got and that were important that didn't matter in the end. But then that was kind of the end of it. I did my... I think I did my shoulder and I was out for a good few months and came back and they're like, you might as well keep kicking. It was Pat Lamb who uh, told me to keep kicking, which was huge for me because obviously I was only doing it socially or, or just because it was required, but he told me to keep doing it. So then I just started kicking and um, I actually got my first 17 kicks in a row in professional rugby. So after that, they're like, you yeah. might as well keep doing it. So yeah, it worked out mm. well. But even coming up to Ulster, you- I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't going to be the kicker or frontline kicker. Wow, and do you crave the opportunity now in a game if it's like the last last five minutes and it's a neck and neck game? Are you like, give me a pop? I hope we get a penalty so I can have a pop. Or are you, or is it still something that you'd be nervous about? Or uh, yeah, I do. I do enjoy it. It's again something I go back to and practice a lot. So I'd spend at least forty minutes an hour the day before every game, kind of writing down my goals and um, writing down certain things that I know I need to do in the game and. Sometimes I read uh, golf books to kind of set me in the right mindset for the game. And it's funny because one game I did have, it was at Edinburgh like two years ago, I had a game at the la- kick of the last play. Um, but I just read a passage from a golfer about exactly the same scenario. So I was nearly like laughing before I took the kick because I just read how he deals with coming down, say the last hole under pressure and, saying that you're not the only person in that position and countless people have been there before you and they've uh, thrived under the circumstances and kind of thought that just for the kick and it relaxed me in a weird way and I ended up getting it that time. So, yeah, I find kind of the more prepared you are and the more you practice in those circumstances, same way I might get a kicking coach to give me four kicks at the end of, of training and give me exact circumstances, whether it's 16 or um, whether a minute left and you have to take 40 seconds of the time, stuff like that. Which then come which a then game, come a game, it makes, game a it makes a lot easier. It's the stuff that we we did when we were kids. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're you're just still you're still doing it. Exactly. Yeah. And whatever you're doing is working, so keep doing it. I I do I, have I, a diff- I'd have a different outlook. I'd say to most kickers, due to the fact that I probably started late, I I I might get annoyed, and I still call it a hobby. And I know it pisses off some kickers who take it incredibly serious, but I still go, well, it's just a hobby. You miss, you miss. So I try to keep it pretty lighthearted. I know some people when I say it's like it's not a hobby, it's your job. Um, but it's probably the way I treat it and I enjoy kicking. So I try to keep it that way and I do find myself getting pissed off sometimes and 
and you start overthinking it, and that's kind of when you forget about it. So some days I might kick three and walk off the field and say, well, it's a Tuesday, it's only, only a hobby, it doesn't matter, I don't kick them on Tuesday. So I think you yeah, kind of have to look at it a little bit different sometimes. I used to, when Raj had a big kick, I used to, I used to will it over by saying the Holy, Ma- Holy Mary. And, uh, you my mother. And, anytime, and it was, <laughs> and anytime he got it, I'd, I'd, I'd turn to myself and go, you're welcome, Raj. Like, <laughs> that's like, <laughs> I, had, that's my mother. I had something to do with it. <laughs> I come home and my mother goes, oh, you put your kicks on the TV. I'm like, oh, gee, do not watch them? No, I can't watch them. And then she'll be there right at the thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> And she's like, well, that's because I said your prayers to, to God. I'm like, that's not why I got them. But yeah, maybe. Leave her have it. Leave her have, have, have it. Whatever you say to yourself or uh, whatever prayers your mom's saying, something's working, so keep doing it. But um, uh, one thing that came out there in the last couple of days, Coons, was um, the IRFU uh, announced that the players have taken a pay deferral. Um, it's a pretty amazing gesture. Um, from the players' perspective, uh, how did that come about? Did Rugby Players Ireland get in touch, or how did that happen? Yeah, um, well, if you look at the world at the moment, everybody is in in turmoil or, or worried about getting cuts. People are getting their jobs lost and stuff like that. So, I think in the grand scheme of things, it's 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 okay. I think it's gonna happen everywhere, and I think we're a bit uh, if we'd be a bit oblivious if we thought nothing's gonna happen to us. So. For me, I didn't didn't see it as an issue because the world is is struggling at the moment, and um, yeah, it is what it is. I think your overheads are going to be lower because no one's traveling, no one's spending as much money. So I think you got to live it in your means, and yeah, I think we would have been a bit in our own world if we thought that nothing would happen to us. Yeah, fair play. I think everyone has a part to play, right, in uh, in doing our bit. So um, you can do you your accounting and come back to us and sort out our, our taxes. I say that. I'll be hopefully. playing Call of Duty in 10 minutes for a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, look, we'll leave you back to Call of Duty and your books and your yeah. accounting. And the dog is obviously demanding to be walked. So, <laughs> yeah, she was, uh, getting, she was asleep a minute ago, but she's running around. Okay. Well, look, John, we really appreciate you coming on, man. Um, best to look at the rest of isolation and... Yeah, we'll see you on the other side. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Good luck. Goodbye. Part three. uh, In these times of quarantine, uh, self-isolation and staying at home, for the benefit of us all, Trimby and I have decided that each week we're going to pick a movie and uh, an album that we've watched or listened to during the week and discuss them because we've nothing else to do. So... um, this week, there's so many options, but I tried to avoid the TV as much as I can, Trimby. Um, but I spotted True Romance was uh, an option now on Netflix. <clears throat> One of my favourite films of all time. So I watched it on Friday night uh, with a can of Guinness in my hand, and it was it just blew me away how good that film was. I forgot was. how good it was, yeah. I, w- I watched it a few years ago, um, and yeah, I know it's right up there. It's, it's definitely in my definitely in my top 10 uh, and I just mm-hmm. forgot I just <clears throat> forgot how many cameos there are and how many um, one liners and just I just forgot how good it was and Anna, Anna was glued to it, as well. it, it it actually it says a lot about a movie where whenever I put it on she's running around making a cup of tea she's on her phone a bit and then you know 15-20 minutes into it she's like she's glued to it and I got I won, I won her over I won her over with True Romance Nice, yeah. I, for anyone that hasn't seen it, we won't ruin it for you, but uh, get stuck in. It's about uh, a couple that meet in uh, they meet actually in Detroit, Clarence and Alabama. Um, quite uh, a weird way to meet, let's say. Um, he's a video store nerd guy, and she is a call girl. Um, she's not a hooker; she's a call girl, <laughs> and uh, she. Uh, she gets paid to, to visit him on his birthday and watch a movie with him and he doesn't know and then they fall in love. He wants to get her stuff from her pimp and he goes to get the pimp, goes to the pimp's gaff, gets her stuff G- back. Gary Oldman. And ends up taking Gary Oldman. Looking very so, on Gary Oldman like. Yeah, well, you're right. The, 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 I think I read somewhere like this is the beginning of films where they use all these random cameos um, and they just throw the kitchen sink at True Romance. So you're watching it and you're like 20 minutes in 
and next thing you're like this is class this is Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette in two of their best roles and then all of a sudden uh, Gary Oldman is this pimp who uh, is trying pretending to be black but he's he's clearly a white guy he's I, I don't understand I don't understand it I thought it was hilarious but I didn't understand it it ain't white boy day <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah Oh, that scene with him, with him and and uh, Christian Slater when he's getting his stuff back, um, is phenomenal. And then Dennis Hopper shows up as Christian Slater's dad for ten minutes, and then uh, Christopher Walken shows up and has this unbelievable scene. Raj, then, Raj Walken, Raj Walken, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, James Gandolfini before he became uh, you know famous for the good for the Sopranos, he's a bad guy. Brad Pitt just decides that he's like wants to be in this movie and he's a a, a roommate bum sitting on the couch. Hey, well, had Brad Pitt um, had he had he do, done much at this stage? He had done Thelma and Louise and uh, but he was like everyone knew he was going to be a superstar. Uh, uh, he was hot property and then he just decided which he did quite well throughout his career he has done in picking quite random roles to do um, and this one was just up there at the best uh, just like a little stoner lying on the couch he's about pff, three scenes in the whole film um, so uh, yeah I think like you might have noticed it, Barry you might have noticed um, there was one more cameo I'm just about to send it to you here now it was um, Roman Intimac was in um, Dream of Romance. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, superb! <laughs> he's one of the. He's, he's gangster of, number four. He's one. Yeah, he's one of Christopher Walken guys um, that comes into the the drop at the end. He kicks the door open. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's superb. Is he smoking a cigarette in any scene? I'd be astounded if he's not smoking a cigarette. <laughs> a la Entomac. Um, I love those Sicilian guys with their sunglasses. Um, so any uh, yeah any any penguins that want to get involved in this and tell us your favorite scene. I think we have to vote for a favorite scene here. Um, I've broke it down into a few. The 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 when they fall in love for the first time, uh, when they've had their night of passion and then they're sitting on the balcony and she he works out that she's a call or she tells him that she's a call girl and then he's like. It's grand. It's fine. And then that muse and then they tell each other they love each other and it's only after a few hours of meeting each other and Hans Zimmer's music kicks in. Do 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 that's mm-hmm. like just hairs in the back of your neck. So there's that. Then there's the Christopher Walken and uh Dennis Hopper scene when Dennis Hopper won't tell him where his son is and Christopher Walken saying he's that he's a Sicilian and Sicilians know when people are lying and uh he knows that he's lying and then Hopper comes out with this unbelievable uh, story about Sicilian people who were spawned from the Moors from Africa uh, is just and that's a tar- so Tarantino wrote the film he didn't direct it Tony Scott wrote it but that is some scene man to- I think Tarantino heard a- that at a bar one night that story and then he wrote it into the film yeah he um, yeah. Hopper is um, he's, he's really anxious and nervous and he's frightened by how intimidating Walken is until a point and I guess the point and then he just goes this guy's going to kill me regardless so then he just he totally loosens up and then he just starts um, just sharing this incredible story and his whole yeah. everything just changes uh, that, that, yeah. that scene's the one for me is it? Uh-huh. okay was that one or then the, the Drexel who is Gary Oldman when himself and Christian Slater meet for the first time and he's he thinks he's kind of scaring Christian Slater because he's a pimp and he's like eating his Chinese food and he's throwing the light at him and stuff and Christian Slater's just not not put out by it like he's like remember he's like there's a there's a TV with next to you and, and there's there's a titty on the TV and you're not even looking at the titty <laughs> that shows me that you're nervous and then he's like and then Christian Slater's like comes back he knows exactly what film it is he's seen it like 20 times <laughs> so he's like just completely double double bluffs him um, and then they have this and Samuel L. Jackson is actually in the, is he in that yeah he's in that's one right I forgot about him yeah cameo. he pops up there's a blood there's a lot of bloodbath in it it's it's uh it's pretty it's uh there's a lot of shooting there's there's stuff. more there's a lot of blood in the <clears throat> Patricia Arquette and uh, Gandolfini scene yeah towards the end where they turn up at the the hotel yeah 
that's 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 an unbelievable scene. I think that's I heard somewhere talking before about that gets a bit real when that kicks in. It's like the whole film has been a little bit yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah. some someone's dream, and then when that comes in, you're like, holy shit, uh, he's really he's beating the crap out of her, and he's a bit of a psychopath. Um, but she she eventually uh, wins out in the end. But yeah, she still she yeah. looks spot on in the next scene though. She just takes sort herself out, and she's fine again. She's like, yeah, I got I got hit by a basketball in the face. <laughs> yeah. She's fine. Uh, so yeah, that's. I think I'll I'll go with the James with the Christopher Walken, uh, Dennis Hopper scene. My favorite. Yeah. Um, and I love my what my wife and I Orla, we both realized within a few weeks of going out that this was our favorite film, and we had the song that they have sex to at the start as our first dance song. It's called. <laughs> it's the first time you had sex. <laughs> 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 it's called Wounded Bird by Eddie and Jojo and that's how far back my love for this song goes um, or that film goes so yeah that's our movie of the week Penguins if you haven't seen it check it out um, keeping with that theme of because they end up in LA right so thinking of keeping with that theme uh, LA and 90s we decided to go with our album of the week is Californication from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, I love when, when music frames the time of my life. Can you remember when that came out? Uh, vaguely, vaguly, but I, I it, Chili Peppers, just having, since you, since you mentioned it, I've, I've um, watched a lot of stuff, um, live at Slane, live at Reading, um, watched a lot of music videos of, of Californication, and I, I was reminded that I went to see Chad Smith um, do a, a drum exhibition in Belfast when I was 16. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I went up to him and got something signed at the end. And, yeah. and I remember I remember the conversation we had because um, I, um, from rugby, I had a shiner at the time. And he goes, um, hey, uh, look at this guy. Dude, he was with Steve. Um, who was that? Um, the drummer. It was a brother of the, the Oasis drummer. I um, can't remember his name. Okay. Uh, but he says, hey, look at this guy. And he goes, um, uh, uh, should have seen the other guy, right? And he goes, <laughs> and he, and he goes not a scratch on him. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so he, it was just basically him and uh, that other drummer, who I can't remember the name of, um, were just like just um, running a, a bit of a workshop, doing a bit of a Q&A. And then Chad Smith played it along to a couple of Chili Pepper songs. So I was 16 and mum and dad drove me down to Belfast specifically to see it. It was class. <laughs> that that must have been just that time when I was sixteen when they released uh, Californication. Someone must have been just after that. Um, he was definitely the one that kept it together the most. Always, he always looks like yeah, very much. So he looks like he looks Not like the, f- the father of the three of the, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the three other lads. He's just like Jesus Christ! What have the rest of you been up to? No, and he looks. He's just happily playing his drum. Like, yeah, I know. I know. He's he's not very rock and roll, but he's uh, yeah. he. So he goes. I assume it was Anthony Kiedis and Flea decided. Right, we're going topless in every music video and every gig ever. And he's like, yeah. Oh, I'm like 15 years older than you. I've got a dad bod. Can we please stop yeah. going topless <laughs> all the time? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. He looks, he's the head off Will Ferrell. You yeah. Ever seen him do that Saturday night. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely the same person, same body shape and everything. Um, okay, yeah, that for me, the reason why framed the time of my life, um, I don't know, when you're 16, I went on holidays. I think that came out in June. I went on holidays to Portugal in July and I just listened to that and it blew my mind. Um, reading Anthony Kiedis' book, Scar Tissue, kind of gives you an idea of how messed up they all were at that time and uh like he was just coming down off pretty heavy drug addiction and john frisciante had left the band in 93 and hadn't been in the he'd been just given up pretty much writing music was an artist and he was in a bad place proper heroin addict um had to you know when they when they finally got him back into the band he he was just like a broken man and they had to piece him back together and that album seems to have come from the darkest place of all their lives, especially the two of them. I think Flea had kind of gotten his act together at that point as well. I don't think he was as reckless as the two boys, but um, all the writing in it just sounds like they've been, and even Frischianti's playing just seems like they've come from 
a place the darkest of places and it's amazing we i always i hear a lot of people talking about when you're when we're trying to write music we think about it, it's like sometimes you write your best stuff when you're in a pretty messed up place um sort of something beautiful and something really uh i don't know creative comes from that side of the world um and then you know their later stuff when they seem to have gotten their stuff act together for me doesn't have that mm. same wildness to it mm. um and uh even paul our sound engineer in studio there in dublin was just telling me about how rick rubin produced this album and he said he they produced it extra loud or mastered it extra loud so when you listen to it it, it was a, a kind of a something that a lot of bands used to do back in the 90s to make their songs jump a little bit more on the radio, they'd produce them or master them of higher, uh, I think higher or louder, like 11 or something like that. And it, at the time, it makes stuff bounce off the radio a little bit more. Oasis used to do it all the time, but it kind of makes it sound a little bit shit years later when you listen back to it. So he told me there's a, an unmastered version that you can listen to uh, that sounds way better because when you do listen to Californication, it's a bit jarring on the ears be honest but um still one of my favorite albums of all time and i think if you listen to it with the head with the mindset of they were absolutely broken and they were getting back together and using this as a way to uh get across how fucked they were or use it as a tool to healing them then <coughs> it's i don't know it even starts with around the world when they're just he's just screaming i don't know if you listen to it Starts really heavy, and then Kate is just like ah, screaming into the abyss, um, and then it goes a couple of tracks like that, and then scar tissue kicks in, and it's it's um, you feel like there's a change. Yes, yeah, scar tissue is my favorite um, song on the album, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I love I love Savior. It's like eleven in, and it's or twelve twelve in, and it's uh, just. Feels like there's a, you know if you listen to that song as a journey, it starts out like they're just like blown off steam, and then it gets into scar tissue third song, and there's like I don't know there's a change in their in their you know, maybe in their approach to life or whatever you know they've they've come through something, and then by the time it gets to Californication, you're just like this is groundbreaking writing, I think you know like his lyrics are phenomenal and just really captures a whole. I don't know, mood in the world. And I feel like in this current climate where we all are trapped up in our houses with fucking God knows what's coming around the corner. Hopefully this is going to be a place where people will create stuff that um, will last and will embody what everyone is going through and bring people together. So dust off your drum kit, man. Yeah, I was going to get, because we have to fill, Anna's made a couple of schedules downstairs and Anna thinks, and I've seen it over the weekend, whenever we get Jack um, into something and we get him a schedule, here's your, your routine for the day, and she's, I'll, t I'll send you a picture of it, it's very, very art arty farty and very creative looking, so he loves that because he knows what's coming next and he knows then he can concentrate and then he can do a couple of lessons, anyway I thought I'll, I'll squeeze in a couple of wee um, drum lessons for him at some stage. Brilliant. Yeah. Quick quiz. Okay. Quick quiz for you. I'll get Mick on. I'll get Mick the baby on the bass, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, quick quiz. Um, uh, Anthony Kiedis and Flea um, starred in a movie in around that time. Can you tell me what the movie was? I I wasn't sure about it, and I just googled it to confirm I know what I thought it was. Flea Flea was in Back to the Future. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, he's he's he pulls up the traffic lights and tells uh, Marty McFly that he's going to race him. Uh -huh. Um. It's not that one, though. No. It's not that one. This is uh, we've referenced uh, uh, an actor from this movie in um, uh, another movie that we talked about, <laughs> kind of to our today. To our, no, uh, 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 like the live show in Dublin. I don't. I don't know. It's Patrick Swayze, and it's Point Break. Ah, okay. Yeah. That could be a good one to watch, man. Yeah. Okay. Um, I give me another one, quick one. My wife is looking in the window here. <laughs> She wants to get back into the house. <laughs> another what? Another movie? No, did you have another question? Or was that the no, that one? was it. Just one question in the quiz. Okay. So you're all Perfect. Done. Penguins, if you've got any more questions on that album or those films or anyone else has any suggestions what we should review next week, we'd love you to do it. Um, we, uh, we, we've got our Penguin of the Week nominations. We've uh, Wayne Marshall, 
who uh, drew a crudely photoshopped kind of picture of me, you, and Pat, um, which I thought was so crap that it was impressive. Uh, <laughs> it was I the dog? It was from it was from uh, I Am Legend, where I was the dog. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. Sorry about that. I meant to say to you, sorry. That's fine. I appreciate it. <laughs> Dog, dog's be, man's best friend. Uh, that's first penguin of the week. Second one is Padder de Bluet, uh for sharing the video of the shed aquarium penguins who have all been allowed to wander around the zoo and visit the other animals, which I just thought was <laughs> fantastic. Um, and then John, who messaged our Facebook group from London, also uh, saying that he has um, got COVID-19, but all is, is going well and... I think he has to be our penguin of the week, really. Yeah, to be fair, yeah. 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 Come on, John. So, self-confessed penguin and uh, unfortunately has uh, COVID-19. So, John, you're our penguin of the week. All the best. We we hope you recover and battle through it, man. (laughs) Keep yourself to yourself, John. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, all right, look, that's been a long show, so we're going we're gonna to wrap up and uh, get back to your families and we'll get back to ours. Um, stay well. All right, Trimby. Party on. Party on. This has been Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness Party on. Party on. on.